Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Park Place Community Church, and we want to thank you for watching this teaching video. We hope that it's a blessing and a help to you. God bless you. Um, as this morning, again, we want to continue um, to stand with the nation of Israel. And, you know, if somebody says, Pastor Ken, how long are you going to stand with Israel? As long as it takes, right? As long as it takes, we're going to be standing with Israel and the level of anti-Israel or anti-Semitism in our country is frankly, it's kind of scary. I mean, it, it shocks me, it's surprising. And that's why a few weeks ago we decided we're gonna stick with the Psalm 23 series, but we're gonna do a little um, mini message, a nugget, if you will, of why God stands with the people of Israel. Now, this morning, it might be a little bit more than a nugget. <laughs> it might be a little bit more. But, but it's so important that we do this because when you say the word Israel, uh, people have sometimes really strong opinions, sometimes very strongly negative, sometimes very strongly positive. But again, it blows me away, even in the church, how many Christians are saying things against Israel, saying that God has given up on Israel and it's basically Christian anti-Semitism. So there are these three systems, we're not gonna talk about them a lot, um, three systems, you can bring them up there. Um, we're not gonna talk a lot, a lot about them, but, uh, and let me just say, I'm not a systems guy. I don't like systems, because what happens is when you tie yourself to a system, then you read the Bible, and instead of reading it for what it says, you try to make it correlate with your system, right? So you misunderstand things because you're trying to make it fit in what you've already decided is true. I would just rather read the Bible for what it says and just let it fit into what it fits into. So I'm not really a systems guy, but we'll, we'll talk about these three um, just a little bit. Dispensationalism, covenant theology, replacement theology. Sounds really deep, right? Well, one of the reasons I'm not gonna talk about it that much is because I'm not that smart. <laughs> I mean, the guys that come up with these systems, they're really smart guys, that in my opinion, they're trying to make the Bible so complicated that us simple people can't understand it. And I don't wanna do that. I just wanna make things as simple as possible. I, I believe the Bible is simple. It's so simple, you'd need somebody's help to misunderstand it. Now, unfortunately, there's lots of these people that are trying to help, trying to help us misunderstand it. But this first one, dispensationalism, it, the basis of it is a real literal interpretation of the Bible, even prophecies and things like that, that a very literal interpretation. And I'm very literal. If, if there's a possibility of, of taking things in the Bible literally, I'm going to take it literally. Now, there's some things that you just know common sense wise are, are not literal. You know, they're just trying to proof point or something, but, but most of the Bible I take literally. And in dispensationalism, it is that Israel and the church are distinct from each other. The, the church and the nation of Israel, they are distinct. Now, covenant theology, there's more continuity between the church and Israel. There, there's more, you know, combined, and, and that it talks about the Gentiles, when they get saved, they're grafted into Israel. Now, when I look at it, it seems to me more that when people of Israel accept Jesus, they become part of the church. That, that's what it appears to me when I read the Bible. But it's like, you know, two circles that overlap each other. One is Israel, and one is the church. Well, there's this overlap of Jewish people that have accepted the Messiah, and they're in both camps. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm not trying to make it complicated or anything. And then the most far-fetched one, and I don't believe hardly anything of this, and that is replacement theology. And I think this is what causes a lot of the problems and misunderstanding in the church. And replacement theology is um, that the church replaces Israel. 
Like God used to have this heart for Israel, but now he has a church and he's forgotten about them. You know, that Israel nation. They're old, they're old history. They're old, you know, he's moved on to the church. And I just don't see it that way. And it's answered so plainly in the Bible. Uh, Romans 11, verse 1, it says, I ask then, and people are literally asking the same exact question today, which is causing all the controversy. They're asking the same question, has God rejected who? His own people, the nation of Israel. Of course not. And this is Paul talking. He says, I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Now you may think, tribe? What's, what's his tribe? Well, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The, the generations and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob's name was eventually or, or changed by God to Israel. And that's the first time we see the word Israel ever in the Bible. It was a dude. It was Jacob. God changed his name to Israel. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons were the 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel comes out of these 12 tribes. So if they're like the foundation, you know, if they're like what Israel is made up of, they must have been perfect, right? No, they were jacked up just like we are. The, the, the sons of 12 tribes, they were jacked up like we are. So has God rejected them because they were jacked up? Because they were messed up. I always ask people that say things like, well, God's rejected them because they were jacked up. I always ask them, has God rejected you? Because <laughs> you're pretty jacked up. <laughs> I'm pretty jacked up. I, isn't that something we all have in common? That we're all kind of jacked up in some area of our life? So has God rejected us because we're jacked up? No. And God hasn't rejected Israel because they're jacked up. So the Apostle Paul answers that question very emphatically. Has God rejected his people, the nation of Israel? Verse 2, he says, no. I don't know how it could get any more plain than that. No, God has not rejected his own people whom he what? Chose from the very beginning. So remember, we talked about chose for what? Like what, what did God choose them for? Did he choose them to be right with him, to go automatically to heaven, to get a free pass to heaven because they're God's chosen people? No, he didn't choose them for that. He chose them for the Messiah, Jesus, to come through their lineage. So why does God keep sticking with Israel when they keep messing up? When they have jacked up lives, when, when they're messed up, why does God continue to stick with them? Romans 11, starting verse 28, says this. Many of the people of Israel are when? Now. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of God. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. But how many of you know the same thing applies today? Many, I think you could say most, but far majority of Jewish people, people in Israel, are enemies of the good news, just as current today, same today. This is exactly why people say, God has given up on them. People say, oh, God should just give up on those Jews. They're not accepting Jesus. Well, again, I want to ask you this question. Has God given up on you? Because <laughs> at one time, you were an enemy of the gospel. All of us were. Before we accepted Jesus, we were enemies of the gospel. Now, I believe that 
people that say that, oh, God should just give up on those Jews. I believe what they're really saying is that they would give up on the Jews if they were God. How many of you are glad they're not God? <laughs> How many of you are glad I'm not God? You're not God. How many of you are glad that we're not God? God is God. And he makes decisions different than we do. Remember, we always talk about here, the Bible says that God's ways are what? Higher than our ways. God has this perspective that we don't have. See, we just see things kind of literally, right? Here on our plane, you know, what's going on? But God's ways are higher. He has this bigger vantage point and he sees what's going on. He sees when he says, you know, when you're going down to Bellevue, instead of going on 522, you should probably go over to Everett on Highway 2 and then down I-5. Why? Because God sees the perspective of the meteor that's coming out of outer space that's going to blow up 522. See, we don't see those things. So we, we think, oh, we know all this stuff. No, we just see on this linear plane here, but God has this bigger perspective. And he sees all these things that we don't see. So he goes on and he says that the Jews being enemies of the gospel, of the good news, he says, this benefits you Gentiles. Now, I think it's pretty safe to say we're all in here Gentiles, right? Because there's Jews and Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so the Jews not accepting the gospel created this little opening <laughs> that we could sneak in, that, that us Gentiles could, could get in. He says, yet they are still the people he loves. Even though they were enemies of the gospel, they were still people he loved because he what? Chose. He chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then this powerful, powerful statement he makes here. Thank God for this. Verse 29. For God's gifts and his call. Who he calls, who he, chose, who he chooses can never be withdrawn. Now, how often is never? <laughs> it's never, right? Who he chooses, who he calls, can never be withdrawn. Now, the more popular way that we hear this, can't we tell I'm kind of excited this morning? Yeah. I apologize. I'll try to tone it down a little bit. But, but the most popular way we think of this scripture, verse 29, is out of the King James Version. Now, I'm not a big King James guy. Because I don't talk like that, right? We, we read the Bible and it's like, it doesn't even talk like we talk. I think it's hard to understand. If you're into King James, I have no problem with you. Go for it. I, I, I just am not into it. But verse 29, this is how we mostly understand this because we, we see it mostly from this standpoint. Verse 29 in the King James Version, it says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That, that's how we understand that. And we, as Christians, come on, we're goofy, right? We, we're Christians. We're, we, we come up with goofy definitions. We, we put religious definitions on words, even if they have nothing to do with what the word means. We'll just make up a goofy Christian definition for words. And repentance is one of them. But we just make these goofy definitions of. We, we've misunderstood repentance because we almost always add two words to it. Repentance of sin. So, so we just add those words even though they're not there. We just kind of add them to it. Well, the Greek word that's translated repentance is the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia. Meta meaning change. Noia meaning thoughts. Metanoia, repentance means a change of thinking. So when the Bible talks about repentance, it's rarely, if ever, talking about repentance of sin. It, it almost never is talking about that. 
it's almost always talking about the solution for sin, the, the solution to sin. And we've all heard the fiery preacher, right? The fiery preacher yelling, you need to repent. And what is he saying? He's saying, you need to stop sinning. That, that's what we think repent means. We think repent means that you need to feel bad or, or stop sinning. But, but check this out. And, and this is Jesus talking in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. A lot of people think this is John the Baptist talking. But because the first part of Mark chapter 1, it is John the Baptist, you know, doing all these things and talking. But here's where it switches. And this is Jesus talking. He says, the time is fulfilled, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. So if repent means stop sinning, then Jesus would be saying, stop sinning and believe the gospel. So how many of you think if we had the ability to stop sinning, we wouldn't need to believe the gospel, right? As a matter of fact, if we had the ability to stop sinning, we wouldn't need Jesus, right? Because the whole purpose behind Jesus coming and dying here is because we had a problem with sin that we couldn't handle ourselves. So, so when he says, repent and believe the gospel, repent obviously does not mean stop sinning. So biblical repentance is almost always, remember the word means a change of thinking, it's almost always a changing of your thinking or a change of mind from I can do it myself by obeying the law. Because all the people that Jesus were ta was talking to at that time, they were all from when they were in little Hebrew school, right? Running around little Hebrew school, and they all grew up believing in the law. That I can just obey the law, and that will get me to God. Repentance, Jesus is saying, repent, change your thinking from I can do it myself by obeying the law to I can't do it myself. I need a savior. I need Jesus. So, so that's what he's talking about when he says repent. So when God chose Israel, and it says that it's without repentance, that is saying that God can't change his mind about it, but that it's already settled. And actually, the, the God's word translation, I love how it says it there. It says that God never changes his mind when he gives gifts or when he calls someone. So again, how often is never? <laughs> it's never, right? God never changes his mind when he gives gifts or calls someone. So here's the big misunderstanding. And I kind of can see already we're not going to get to Psalm 23. Will you guys forgive me? Come back next week for Psalm 23. So here's the big misunderstanding. What did he choose Israel for? So many times we think, well, he chose them to be, you know, um, right with him, like a free pass to heaven. Like they, they can just be with him. They can be right with him. But let's see in Romans chapter 9 where some of this confusion comes from. And this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church at Rome and it's so important, you guys, that we get this. There's so much misunderstanding about this. It's so important that we get this. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Paul, this is Paul, writing a letter. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. 
my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. Confirm what? My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for who? My people. This is Paul talking. My people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. So can you see, Paul is just like in grief and sorrow. Why? Because the Jewish people, he says, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ. Paul is saying, I would give up my own salvation if that would save them. Can you see Paul's heart just being poured out here for the Jewish people? He would give up his own salvation if they could be saved. So if Paul was willing to give up his own salvation, but God is just going to cut them off? Are we thinking that Paul loves more than God? No, certainly not. God loves the Jewish people even more than Paul. And Paul is willing to give up his own relationship with God if they would be saved. Verse 4, it says, They are the people of Israel chosen, man, that word is so important, chosen to be God's adopted children. Now, let's just look at all the things that God did for Israel, gave to Israel. It says, God revealed his glory to them. Now, glory is another weird religious word that us goofy Christians give a goofy definition to. But glory just simply means what you stand for, who you are, the thing that's the most obvious about you. God showed himself to the people of Israel. He revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them. Can you imagine God coming down and making an agreement, a handshake, a blood covenant with people? He did that with Israel and he gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him. Can you imagine? God gave them the ability to worship him and he gave them or they were receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors and Christ himself. Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, Jesus is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise, amen. So here is where the controversy kind of comes up. At the time that Paul was writing this, this was a controversy at the time. And the controversy was the Jews saying things like, hey, if we're Jews and we're chosen by God, doesn't that mean we're right with him? Why do we have to do this Jesus thing? Because we're already God's chosen. So they're asking questions like that. Like, aren't we just automatically right with God? Because we're his chosen people? Paul addresses this very specifically. Verse 6, he says, Well then, has God failed to, fill, to fulfill his promise to Israel? So Paul, often in his writing, is coming up with these questions that he knows is going to be in the minds of the readers as they're reading it. Has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No. Why? For not all who were born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. 
being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. See, Abraham didn't receive this promise based on his lineage or based on his performance. He received the promise. Remember, it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So he didn't get it by performing or who his relatives were. He got it by believing. It was based on him believing. So being right with God has always, is now, and always will be about faith. Always. It's never been you could be good enough and get in right with God. Never. It was always by faith. It goes on, it says, for the scriptures say, and remember as Paul's writing this, there was no New Testament. Paul was writing it, right? So when he says the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, though Abraham had other children too. So this is Paul saying lineage is important, but not to be right with God. It's important because it's who the Messiah is going to come through. Come on, that's pretty important. But it's not to be right with God. So the Messiah, who is the ultimate promise, when it talks about the promise that would come through Abraham, it's talking about Jesus ultimately. He is the promise. Verse 8, it says, this means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Because remember, it doesn't happen through lineage to be right with God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. So the promise is who? Jesus. So it's only through faith or believing in Jesus that you are considered to be Abraham's children. The promise is by faith. So you can't be right with God based on who your great, 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 granddaddy is. If you can chase, see your lineage go all the way back to Abraham, that's not good enough to be right with God. So he is contrasting natural children versus spiritual children. People that are natural descendants of Abraham versus people that are spiritually, because of their belief in Christ, children of God. So, and he's not even talking about who's better. He's just saying they're different. Right? He's not saying all oh, those nasty physical descendants. He just got done saying, I'm one of them. So he's not downing them. He's just saying it's different. So here's where the misunderstanding really gets off. And in verse 9 of Romans chapter 9, it says, For God had promised, I will return about this time next year. And Sarah will have a son. So this is God promising to Abraham and Sarah that they will have a son. Verse 10, this son was our ancestor Isaac. So Abraham, Isaac, and then it says when he or Isaac married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. So this is the apostle Paul and he's writing a letter to the church at Rome, mostly Jews at that time, because the church started as mostly Jews accepting Jesus. So I think that we don't understand this stuff, like in Romans chapter nine, and I'm not trying to be offensive or anything, but I think the reason we don't get it 
is because we have a very poor understanding of the Old Testament. Can anybody just admit that? I mean, we as Christians, if we read the Bible at all, we read the New Testament, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but, but we don't have a good understanding of the Old Testament. So we don't get these things because Paul is relating it back to a story in the Old Testament. Remember, it says, as Scripture says, that's Paul writing. He's saying, as the Old Testament says. So, so he's relating it back to this story. Now, this gets a little deep. I apologize. It's going to be kind of like a Bible study, but please try to stick with me. The Apostle Paul is writing it to those folks that grew up from little Hebrew school, right? Knowing this story. It's the story of the twins, probably the most famous twins in all of history, right? When, when she's going to birth these twins, he's talking about the story in Genesis 25. That's what he's referring back to that. So in verse 22, it says, but the boys pushed against each other inside of her. And she said, and any woman that's ever birthed twins can probably relate to this statement. She said, if this is what it's like, why did it happen to me? <laughs> She's like, whatever's going on inside me, I wish I wouldn't have said, pick me, pick me, you know? And she didn't know she had twins. Because I mean, you know, they didn't have ultrasound back then, right? They didn't have that little thing that they put on to, oh, there's two in there. She had no idea. She had no idea there was twins. She just knew there was something going on inside of her. So she went to ask the Lord. See, we're used to going to ask the doctor. Hey, could you do an ultrasound? <laughs> but back then they had to go and ask the Lord, right? I think we should get back to that. Does anybody else think we should get back to going and asking the Lord? And the Lord said to her, and this is so important because this is what we miss. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. See, we think that what Paul's talking about here is just two guys, two individuals. But, but God said, two nations are in your womb, two different peoples, plural. So we, in our society, how many of you know we're all about individual rights, right? I am woman, hear, hear me roar, you know. I, I'm, uh, you know, um, I, I don't want to get into that, but we just always want to get individual rights. but. In their culture, they didn't really talk about individual rights that much. They talked about groups of people. So two nations are in your room, two different people. One people or group will serve the other or be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. So if you remember the order of birth, Esau came out first, right? And then Jacob came out. So Esau was the older one. It says in verse 24, when she reached the end of her pregnancy and they came out, that's when she realized, whoa, there was two. <laughs> so she had twins. So back to Romans 9, in this context, this is what Paul is talking about. In this context, verse 11, it says, but before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. Come on, mamas that have had sons. You, you know what they're talking about. Before they burnt the house down with a big lighter, or, you know, got, boys get into all sorts of stuff, right? But, but he's saying before they had done anything, really saying before they had sinned. Before they did anything, good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people based, not according to their, their good or bad, but based on his own purpose. So as things were back then, Esau came out first he should have had the birthright, right? Because he was the oldest. 
But this is saying that this message shows that God chooses people based on what he wants to do. Not, not, not based on any tradition or, or how things go in our world. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. Now, never in the Bible, ever, 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 ever did Esau serve Jacob. It just never happened. But the people of Esau did serve the people of Jacob. Does that make sense? He's not talking about individuals here. He's talking about nations or groups of people. So here's where it totally goes off the rails for many people. And this is one of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. Romans 9, 13 says in the words of scripture, which again is Paul quoting what? The Old Testament. In the words of scripture, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. So the misunderstanding comes from this word hate, right? How many of you have had trouble with that? You know, that, that God hated Esau? So many people say that this was God choosing Jacob to go to heaven and Esau to go to hell. So they build a doctrine around it of hell, 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 hell. Oh, you're lucky one, you get to go to heaven. Hell, like God is making this predetermined choice of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. But, but that's not what it's saying here. Hate means something totally different back then than it means now. Um, hate, the word hate, is all about choosing one over another. The literal definition of the word hate back then was to love less. So I love this one and I hate this one means I love this one, I love this one a little bit less. Now that'll make sense to you here in a little bit. So. Let, let me just give you a natural example that I think many of us, especially us guys, can relate with. Remember in junior high gym class? How many of you can remember that far back? Ooh, it's been a while. But in junior high gym class, remember when the gym instructor would pick two captains? And then the captain would pick the teams, right? One, he'd pick one and he'd pick one until they got down to the end. And at the end, it came down to between you and the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> Come on. You know it's real. You know it's true. So it came down to, to you and the guy in the wheelchair. And the captain was like, ah. and they kick you. <laughs> it, he hated the guy in the wheelchair. It doesn't mean he hated him like we think of hate. It just means he loved them a little bit less because he chose you over the guy in the wheelchair. Now, this actually happened to me a lot when I was in school because my mom moved around a lot. So I was always a new kid, so they didn't know, you know, the ability that I had, but I showed them on the field, <laughs> especially when the guy in the wheelchair was guarding me. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 <laughs> That's the choosing. That's the hating and loving that, that Paul is talking about. He's saying he chose one over the other. So let's see a, a Bible example of this. In this scripture is one of the scriptures that I call a JS scripture. JS stands for just skip, <laughs> right? How many of you know there's scriptures that you read and you're like, whoa, I don't get that, so I'll just skip it. <laughs> you know, we do that when we come up with a, a scripture that we don't get. Instead of actually studying it and finding out what it really means, well, it's too hard to skip it. You know, I'll just go past I want to keep reading. So here's one of them, Luke 14, 26. It says, whoever comes to me and doesn't hate Father and mother, spouse and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life, cannot be my disciple. 
No, oh, let's just skip that, <laughs> right? That's too hard. No, this morning we're not going to skip it. Do you think he's really talking about hating mama? <laughs> like God is saying that we need to hate, like our version of hate? Mom? Of course not. What he's saying is, if you're not willing to choose me above them, you cannot be my disciple. We have to be able to choose God over anything, right? So, so that's what hate means. Is not the uh, hate them. It means that you're willing to choose something above something else. So that's why I like the word, wording of the NLT, the New Living Translation of Romans 9 and 13. It says it this way. In the words of scriptures, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Like, I had to choose who Jesus is going to come through. So I love Jacob. I chose Jacob. Doesn't mean I hate, condemned to hell. I mean, you know, in that scripture, it says you need to hate your mom. It's not saying mom is going to hell. It's just saying you're willing to choose God over them. God's saying, I love Jacob. I chose him for the Messiah to come through, but I rejected Esau. I had to choose one. I chose Jacob. So if it wasn't talking about heaven or hell, like many people think, what was he choosing for? The lineage, right? Who Jesus was going to come through. The Messiah would come through the lineage of Jacob. So if this salvation thing seems confusing, sometimes we read that and we're like, oh, this kind of seems confusing. Don't you wish Paul would have just given a summary? <laughs> At the end, you know, like he just got to the end and just decided to give a summary. Well, I'm glad you asked because the Apostle Paul actually did. He gave us a summary in verse 30. He says, what does this all mean? Because <laughs> he was expecting us to when we read it go, man, <laughs> what does this all mean? So he says, what does this all mean? Even though the Gentiles we're not trying to follow God's standards. The Gentiles didn't care. They didn't have the law. The law was never for the Gentiles. They didn't have the law. So they weren't even trying to obey the law. They were just going through life, you know? They weren't trying. But it says, even though they weren't trying, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, who tried so hard, right? The Jewish people from the time they were in little Hebrew school, trying to obey the law, trying to be as good as they can, trying to do everything right, checking all the boxes, doing everything. It says, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. They never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of trusting in him. How many of you know you can never get to him by being right, by doing the right thing, by trying to check all the boxes, do all the right things? It will never get you there. Because the only way to get there is by faith in Jesus, trusting in him. So God's not done with Israel. We're done with Israel for this morning. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week. But God's not done with Israel. As far as salvation, you know what he's doing? He's waiting. He's waiting for Israel to wake up to everything that God has said and realize that it's not about the law. It's not about obeying the law. He's waiting for them to realize they need a savior just like all of us do. Do you know what he's waiting for them to do? Repent. <laughs> 
Not stop sinning. That's not what it's talking about. No, don't get me wrong. It's a good idea to stop sinning. And all of you that are sinning, I recommend that you stop. <laughs> right? I'm not recommending keep sinning. But that's not what repentance means. Repentance means to change your mind from I can get close to God, I can be right with God by my own effort. To a change of thinking that I can't do it myself. I need a Savior. I need Jesus because I can't do it myself. I can't do enough right things to get to Him. I have to accept what He did. He sent Jesus to me because I was unable to get to him. So he sent Jesus to me. He chose Israel to send the Messiah through. But they have to get to him the same way that we all did. Through Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I'm so thankful. That you didn't just leave me out there trying to get to you. That you came to me. And as we come up to the, the Christmas season coming up, and you named Jesus Emmanuel that was God with us. You came to us. Because we couldn't get to you. So God, I pray that as complicated as the things we talked about this morning was, God, I pray that the simplicity of the gospel would just become so real to people that everything all boiled down is just simply about repentance, changing from I can do it myself to I need Jesus. I pray that we would all come to that realization of our need for Jesus. God, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I apologize that I didn't get to um, our series, No God, No Fear, about Psalm 23, um, but we will um, pick that up next week and, and talk about um, us being like sheep. <laughs> it's not flattering, let me just warn you. <laughs> it's not super flattering. But I hope you got something out of this this morning, and uh, we'll have a short time of fellowship in the back. God bless you. Have a great day.